Thank you. Thanks, thanks. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. It's incredible to be here. Oh my goodness, this is my first time at Campus Party and it's amazing. I wish I had had this opportunity when I was in university. So thank you for inviting me to be here and thank you for being here to listen to, to what I have to say today. Uh, so I am a professor in ethics and technology. And the story that I want to tell you today is about how we can use ethics as a resource, how it can be something that can help uncover what are the ethical and societal issues, but how it can be something much more than that. It can help us look for solutions to these issues. And the reason why I, I start by, by saying that is because right now there's a, a bit of a, a theme out there that sometimes ethics stifles innovation, right? That we're, the ethicists are sitting there saying, no, don't do that, don't do anything. Uh, and it doesn't have to be like that. And ethicists are working hard to sort of change that reputation, but also to show how we can help inspire new kinds of innovation. And as a disclaimer also, as I mentioned, I'm a professor, so I have the tendency to lecture. And uh, I'll do my very best, though, to keep this lively and upbeat and engaging to, to try and inspire more than just <laughs> lecture from the stage. Okay, so um, something else that's important is I want to tell you a little bit about where I came from because that sort of feeds my narrative, that helps feed my story to show you where it is that I started and that gets me to the, to the end point. So I, I have a background in cell biology. I studied cell biology in Canada, which is not your typical starting point for an ethicist. But anyway, while I was doing my studies, I was also a research assistant at CSTAR, which stands for Canadian Surgical Technologies and Advanced Robotics. And this is a robotics institute in Canada, and we were working with some of the world's first surgical ro robots. So the Zeus telesurgical system, I don't know if anyone has heard about this, but this is the robot that can do long distance remote robotic surgery, and then the Da Vinci surgical system. So this is back like 15 years ago. This is when we're first rolling out these robots. And I I was part of a technical team, so I'm, I'm, I wasn't studying ethics or philosophy at all. I was part of a technical team, and we were training surgeons how to use these robots. But on top of that, we were also looking at testing what would happen to their performance if we introduced a delay between when the surgeon moved their hands and when the robot actually moved, uh, you know, yeah, when the robot actually moved. And of course, we didn't do this on human subjects. I should say that first, right? That when we were introducing a delay or a variation in a delay, we were doing dry lab exercises. But when I was a part of this team, we were just trying to look at how we could get the doctors to understand the technology and how they could perform in an efficient way. And I kept on asking different sort of inconvenient questions, they called them, where I was you know, saying, how does the surgeon feel about performing surgery in this way? They're not standing over the patient anymore. They're not even touching the patient, right? They're, they're at a console. They're sitting in something like this in the other side of the room or in the other side of the hospital. So this is a complete rethinking of how surgical practice happens. And are we talking to the surgeons about how they're experiencing this, how they're feeling about this? And my boss said, no, 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 no. We're trying to get the machines to work, Amy. Stop asking these questions. And then I started asking more questions though. And I said, well, what about the nurses in this space, right? Because now you don't have a team of people standing around the patient, you know, making eye contact, surgeons talking to the surgical staff and to the nurses. Now you have the surgeon who's very much isolated in one side of the room. Like what's happening to the whole team? You know, this, this whole practice of surgery. And so in you know, starting to ask these questions and, and to push back, my boss was saying, I think this is ethics. I think what you're asking me is this field called ethics. So I decided to pivot my studies from cell biology and I thought, well, why don't I explore this field of ethics? And that brought me to where I am today, that I, my whole job in academia is to uncover, to ask these inconvenient questions about robotics and artificial intelligence. And the reason why I share that is because um, there's an important part of that, that because I was part of the engineering team, I also had the chance to experience what that looks like. That, you know, I, I certainly don't ever want to say that it's a, something malicious, that engineers are intentionally not thinking about these kinds of things. I understand that you're trying to get the thing to work, right? And that it doesn't necessarily need to be the job of the engineer to think about all of these other questions. That is the job of the ethicist. 
And that means that we need to bring the ethicists into that space to understand what's going on and to be able to ask these questions so that we can come to solutions. Then about three years ago, so my job, right, is about uncovering what are the ethical issues. And about three years ago, I started to look around at all of the technologies that are you know, commercially available right now. And I thought, it's not enough to just be asking these questions and to be putting this on the table and say, let's do something about it. I wanted to be a part of the solution. And so myself and Noel Sharkey, who is an expert in artificial intelligence over in the UK, he and I founded the Foundation for Responsible Robotics. And this is a not-for-profit organization. We're aimed at trying to bring some of this incredible work that's happening in academia out to the public, to explain to the public what's going on, but also to policymakers. Because right now, we're in a pivotal moment where policymakers are trying to figure out how do we regulate this technology. I'm, I'm part of the European Commission high-level expert group on artificial intelligence. And we've just created AI ethics guidelines and suggestions for regulation. So it's very much, you know, we don't have the answers right now. We are asking the questions and trying to work together with policymakers to figure out how do we go forward? What, what are we supposed to do? So my work in this space is all about, yeah, this, this overall topic of responsible robotics and artificial intelligence. And what I'm also trying to say is that even though I come at this from the perspective of an ethicist, that it's not just about ethics that ethicists have to work together with engineers to understand what's going on, but we also have to work together with, with policymakers. So it's not just about uncovering the issues, but it's about how do we you know, have joined up thinking so that we can come to solutions together. And then, of course, with this, yeah, with this phrase of responsible robotics, this begs the question, okay, so what is irresponsible robotics then? And what we are putting forward right, at the foundation and, and what my academic work is about is to try and visualize, to try and paint a picture of the cycle or the pattern that we're in today. And we would call this an irresponsible cycle, where we're at today. And one you know, point feeds into the other. So this idea that there are very few incentives for companies to want to do better. And with a lack of incentives, this leads companies just to creating bad products. And again, I'm not saying that companies are maliciously and intentionally trying to do this, but if you don't have something that's pushing you to do better or to do it differently, that's the situation you'll be in. And what I mean by bad products are products that erode societal values, values like privacy, sustainability, democracy, well-being, whether it's health or psychological. So we have products that are, yeah, challenging these values. And these values, this is what ethics is about studying. And when you have a challenge to these values and you feel powerless, you have consumers who are dependent on the products, the companies that don't care to do anything. And so it leads us into a situation where there's a lack of accountability on the part of companies. And this lack of accountability then feeds into, if you don't have to be accountable, why bother looking for incentives to do better? To give an example of what I mean here, we could talk about privacy, we could talk about a variety of different things, but we could also just consider electronic waste, right? Now, if we consider electronic waste, we're in a situation where we're creating somewhere between 30 and 50 billion, sorry, 30 and 50 million uh, tons of electronic waste per year around the world. In Europe, this is growing by about three to 5% per year. And we're only recycling anywhere between 20 and 40% of this. So what happens to the rest of it? Well, we're shipping it to other countries, often to poor, underdeveloped countries who don't know how to manage this. And it's not just about the aesthetics of it, right? This isn't, you know, makes for a, a flashy picture, but this isn't the kind of thing that you want to have in your backyard. It's not just about the aesthetics, though. The chemicals that are in these electronic product, products, in this hardware, they seep into the soil. And so this has an impact on the water that people are drinking. This has an impact on the food that is being produced. And people are eating this, right? So there's health and well-being impacts here. So when we consider this in terms of you know, this irresponsible cycle, let's think about, that was just PCs that I, that I had on the picture there. But with robotics products, we're not doing anything to change the current pattern that we're in. So we have a lack of incentives to do things differently. 
And with that in mind, we're just going to continue in the cycle that we're already in. And it's true that we do have the Basel Convention. And this is a convention that prevents the transportation of hazardous materials out from one country to another country. But there's a lack of resources to try and maintain or to uphold the standards of this convention. And so with, with a lack of incentive to do better, you have bad products being made. And by bad products, I mean ones that contribute to this unsustainable practice ones that contribute to um, you know, being shipped off to other countries, or there's no plan for how you recycle them. So that's the cycle, that's the pattern that we're in in robotics in general today. And it doesn't necessarily have to be like that. And one of the projects that we're working on at the Foundation for Responsible Robotics is to disrupt this cycle, to say, let's create an incentive for companies. And so this is also what I mean by you know, wanting to be the kind of ethicist that isn't just uncovering we're in this terrible cycle, but let's also help find ways that we can get out of this. So we're creating a quality mark. And what I mean by a quality mark, are you familiar with fair trade? You know, fair trade products, yeah? Tony Shakaloni is something that's in the Netherlands, but have you heard of Tony Shakaloni? It's like, the, it's the equivalent of fair trade, but it's for chocolate. Anyway, there's a variety of products that you can get out there, some that are, you know, focused on protecting the rainforest. And what we want to do is to provide a mark, a symbol that consumers can then make a choice between the robot products that they buy or the services that they're going to use. And they will know if they see this mark that this robot has had to go through an accreditation process. It's had to go through a kind of audit to make sure that it can meet these kinds of standards. So we want to create an incentive for companies, but we also want to empower the consumer so that they can make a choice about the kind of products that they're buying. So that's one of the things that I'm working on, but what I wanted to really focus in on today was a different issue related to this you know, irresponsible practice. And that issue has to do with um, the place of, of women in robotics, what it's like to be a woman in robotics, but also the fact that you know, there's a lot of talk about the lack of women in STEM in general, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And it's one thing to, to talk about the fact that we have this lack, but it's another thing to look at the downstream consequences of this. Where does this take this? You know, if we roll out the fact that we have this current situation, where is this going to take us in the end? And so what I want to put on the table is this idea that it's kind of like a cycle within the cycle, right? I was talking about irresponsible robotics. And now this is the vicious cycle of women in robotics, that we start with this idea that there's a lack of women in STEM, and it leads us to the idea that we have a gender data gap. And I borrow that phrase from Carolyn Criado Perez, who talks about, she's got this fantastic book called Invisible Woman. Anyway, with, with the lack of the female presence, we have the creation of something called the gender data gap, which leads us into a situation where we have gendered products, and this gendering of the products can result in an unequal impact of the product on women and men. So I'll get into that a little bit later, but what I want to, to look at is how ethics can be helpful in you know, visualizing this and understanding what is going on here, but in also finding ways to disrupt this cycle. And in order for me to do that, I have to say a little bit, just a little bit, about what ethics actually is. And so if there's any philosophy students or ethics students in the audience, of course, I can't give credit to ethics in you know, 10 seconds or left, less, but, but I try. Essentially, ethics is about what it means to be a good person, what it means to act well, to live well. And one of the more common, older traditions is about looking at ethics as the study of the good life, what it is and how we can achieve it. And that it's this ongoing practice. Ethics isn't just a checklist. It's not just a one-time event. Technology is confronting us with new choices, new possibilities. And ethics is about constantly looking at how do we evaluate these new choices? How do we evaluate these new technologies? And we use the language of values and principles to talk about this thing called the good life. Because it's, it's really abstract, you know, to, to really put your finger on it or to grasp it. But when we talk about values like well-being or privacy, sustainability, democracy, these are the elements of a good life. You know, when you believe that you live in a democratic society, you believe that your voice has meaning, that it carries a message, and that contributes to you feeling fulfilled, feeling like that you have a good life. When you have the opportunity for education, when you have the opportunity for healthcare, right? These are all things that contribute to you believing that you have a good life. 
So ethics is about painting a picture of what the good life is in terms of values, and also how you can realize this picture. So there's a clear overlap with policy then. You need, you need policy in order to realize the things that ethics asks of us. And so when we're talking about robot ethics then, Robot ethics is the study of the impact of robotics and sometimes artificial intelligence, if that's the software driving the robot, on the good life. So how could robots change our perception of what the good life is? Or how could robots change what it means to achieve it? So when, you know, when you're thinking about the impact of technology, this, this can happen in multiple ways, right? You can have technology that uh, changes a component of the good life. So if you think about the internet today, right? So I guess you probably don't remember life before the internet, though, do you? But there was life, actually, before the internet, surprisingly. And, um, and now the internet has changed, or the ability to have you know, a smartphone and to be connected immediately. This has now become a component of the good life. Could you imagine? not being connected, <gasps> like not having the internet, oh my goodness. Wouldn't that, I, I don't know, sometimes people go on detoxes and they don't want to have that, but for the most part, don't you get a feeling of anxiety? Or am I of a different generation where now we get a feeling of anxiety when, we don't, when, we're, when we're not connected? So that's showing how technology has actually created this new component of the good life, of what it means to feel fulfilled. And then on the other hand, you can see that Technology can play a different kind of role, right? Relationships, family, being connected. These are things were, that are and were important before technology came into the scene. But we can also see in this you know, new globalized world where people live at a distance from their friends and family, technology can actually create an opportunity for you to maintain those relationships, to create new ones as well, but, but to maintain those relationships. So it's not like it's created a new component that relationships are important, but it helps you achieve them. So the question that robot ethics is looking at is, you know, what is going to be the impact of robots? When people are lonely, is it going to be a requirement then that they have a robot to help with their loneliness? It's also looking at not just once you make the technology, then what are the ethical issues? It looks at the entire life cycle of the robot. So how do we, what are the issues related to the design, to the development, to the use, to the regulation? So it's this whole holistic picture of what's going on in robotics. Now, to give you an idea of some of the specific ethical issues that robot ethics looks at, and you know, there's, there's more than I can give credit to in, in the time that I have to speak, but privacy is a huge one. Maybe I'm in my own echo chamber, but I imagine that people have heard you know, that privacy is like something that a lot of people are thinking about today. Privacy in terms of control over one's data. And now, you know, we have divergent schools of thought. Some people are thinking, before I do anything, I want to see the terms and conditions. I don't know if you've spent time actually reading the terms of all of the cookies now. It takes a long time. But, you know, we're in a situation where people want to know what is it that you're taking? What are you going to use it for? And then we also have another group of individuals that don't care, that are just like, ah, oh, fine. As long as I get my free services, that's fine. Do what you need to do. We can figure that stuff out later. But regardless, there is a situation where, you know, and robot ethics is studying what are the issues related to privacy in terms of control of data. And it's important to note that the robot, you know, right now robots are mostly in factories, but robots are more and more becoming a part of our personal and professional lives. That we see robots in banks, in grocery stores, robots may be delivering your groceries at a certain point in time. And so once you start interacting with the robot, it becomes an incredible vessel for collecting data. Right? And you won't know what it's collecting. Perhaps it's taking a picture of your face. Perhaps it's recording your voice. Perf perhaps it's trying to gauge your emotional expression. But the point is that this is very much an issue that we need to understand and to think about and talk about and to look for solutions to figure out what is the right way of moving forward when robots are interacting with us in that way. And then there's privacy issues that go a little bit further than just control over the data, but that touch on safety and security. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Hello Barbie. I imagine you've heard of Barbie, though. But Hello Barbie was the AI-powered Barbie. So it was Barbie that had AI in it, but that's still up for debate. 
Anyway, there was something like 800 pre-recorded sentences that were stored on a server, and when the child would ask a question to Barbie, it could pick from these sentences, you know, spit back one of them. It would keep a record or a file of all of the conversations and questions that had been asked so that it could, you know, learn over time and create a more intuitive interaction. And this was just hooked up to, you know, the house's Wi-Fi. That's all it was using. And I think it took a day and a half before they figured out that malicious individuals could hack the Barbie and could have direct communication with children. Could ask them questions, could talk to them, could find out if the parents were home, and so on and so forth. So this goes way beyond just control over the data that's being collected and how it's going to be used. Now we're talking about a whole different set of ethical questions, about making sure that people are safe when they're interacting with robots and what safety means. This isn't about the, you know, a huge Barbie falling on top of a kid. This is about making sure that the technology doesn't put them in jeopardy, in any kind of harm. And we're talking about one of the most vulnerable demographics in society, right? So you would think that we should have extra precautions when we're talking about children. So that's another issue that robot ethics touches on. And then if we get into the artificial intelligence or you know, the machine learning question, really, you have this, this question of whether or not the robot will be able to act in an unpredictable way. Right? So the whole, and I imagine this audience understands you know, that robots are the embodied thing that we're talking about, and they can have any degree of autonomy or various degrees of autonomy. And artificial intelligence is the algorithms that can drive, the, the software that can drive the robot. It doesn't have to be AI driven. So if we're talking about a robot that has machine learning capabilities, it's possible that the robot could act in a way that the engineer or the developer hadn't predicted. And when you think about it in that way, right, you have a situation where it's a police officer and the police officer's car had pulled over another car, and the police officer has no idea what happened, why this happened. And, and when you think about a future like that, we are actually at a situation right now where autonomous cars are a big, a big deal, right? And, and which, what, what kind of a decision should the car make? Should the car kill two pedestrians or the passenger, or vice versa, that kind of thing? And, and what if the car makes a decision that was entirely unpredictable? But we're in a situation right now where we get to decide. We get to decide whether or not we want these unpredictable devices in certain contexts, in certain situations. Do we want to have unpredictable technologies in public services like policing or in uh, child welfare? So there's also the use of artificial intelligence to detect when children might be in danger. And that might sound like a really a great idea that you can have that possibility to go through more records than possible, than, than was previously possible. But we have to understand that there are certain biases in the historical data that are used to train the algorithm. And if we don't understand those biases, then we could be exacerbating and, and replicating stereotypes and, and cultural norms that probably aren't best to have in the resulting machine. But the reason why I bring this up is because we get to make a choice about whether or not we want these unpredictable things in, in a variety of situations. And then something else that robot ethics is touching on is this idea of overtrust. And now I know that this is more of a North American example, but I don't know if you're familiar. You know when the GPS first came out, the, the driving assistant, you know, the maps that tells you where to go in your car? Well, in, in the United States and in Canada, we had quite a few examples when this was first rolled out where people would be on the road, right, and um, the GPS is telling them to turn left and there's a lake to the left and the road is straight ahead of them. And instead of going straight ahead, they did what the GPS told them and they turned left and they went right into a lake. Like just uh, amazing. That, that this could happen, that you could totally disregard your own judgment and your own senses and do what the technology told you to do. It's, it's, it's amazing when you think about it, no? Did this ever happen here in Italy? No? Well, that says a lot about Italy then. Well done. And what does that say about North America? <laughs> Anyway, there, there is this tendency to overtrust the technology, to believe that the technology knows better. And they're already, doing, um, they're already doing experiments now in the robotic space where they show that in emergency evacuation settings, people will believe a robot over the emergency exit signs. So they did this experiment where they showed a robot broke down 
and that was part of the experiment. And they had a technician come in and say, sorry, sorry, robot's broken. I'm going to fix it, da, 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 and then leave. And then all of a sudden, smoke is coming in from the doors, and the emergency lights are going off, and so it's, it's time for an evacuation. And you have this broken robot that's pointing and saying, you know, go in this direction. And then you have all of the emergency exits that are pointing, you know, to go in that direction. And in this direction, it's a dark room with no exit. And in that direction, it is the exit. And guess which way people went? They followed the robot. They went into the dark room with no visible exit. And this is with smoke coming in and lights going on. So it's already happening. We're already seeing that people have this tendency to overtrust the technology, even when it has just broken down right in front of their eyes. So the reason why I bring up some of those examples when you have unpredictability, this willingness to overtrust the technology and, and you know, safety and security and privacy issues, one of the first things that robot ethics asks of us is to change the question from what can robotics and artificial intelligence do to what should robotics and artificial intelligence do for us. So it's not just about, well, we can create this really cool toy that hackers can actually get into and communicate directly with your children. Should we be doing this? Should we be creating this kind of toy that can interact with one of the most vulnerable demographics out there? So that's the first thing that robot asks of us. But now getting closer into the, the, you know, the meat or the crux of what it is that I wanted to talk about, there's also something different than just you know, looking at, well, we have this technology, and now what has happened? Ethics can, you know, has traditionally be used, been used in this way when you have something like the Hello Barbie, and you make it, and you go through your product development, and then you use it in the wild as a kind of a social experiment or a real-world experiment, and then that's when you look at ethics. But instead, we're starting to see a shift now. And instead of making ethics this kind of tag on at the end, what if we start with ethics? Or what if we have ethics as something that accompanies the entire product development, the entire life cycle of the robot or the machine learning algorithm development? So let's look at one particular example and see how this feeds into the, you know, this idea of the lack of women in STEM and this vicious cycle. It's a, a common uh, theme right now in the news that people are worried about robotics, automation, artificial intelligence, and the impact that this is going to have on the labor market. That it's taking people's jobs, right? The cartoon is meant to depict that the robot or the AI outperforms humans every time. And so if that happens, you're going to lose your job. And then, I mean, there's report after report, uh, McKinsey, Deloitte, Accenture, talking about how it's anywhere from 15% to 47% of jobs that will be replaced by robotics and or automation. And then at the same time in those reports, they also talk about the fact that new jobs will be created, which is great. I mean, the World Economic Forum is even suggesting it's somewhere around the, the ballpark of 133 million jobs that will be created with a net gain of 58 million. I mean, that's amazing, that's so exciting, right? That changes, that changes this idea of fear of robotics and automation coming into the picture. We're gonna have new jobs, how exciting is that? And then in that same report by the World Economic Forum, they talk about what area these jobs will be in. And the majority of these jobs will be in STEM fields, whether it's data analytics, big data specialists, uh, new tech specialists will, will come onto the scene. But the point is that it will be in some variation in STEM fields. And then when you start to get deeper into this conversation and you realize, well, who is in these STEM fields right now? And you look across the globe, with the exception of some Eastern European countries, um, but across the globe, you see a disproportionate representation of people who are in STEM fields. That the majority of these people are men, with anywhere between 12% um, and 20 26% of the population being female. So in the UK, it's somewhere around uh, 9 to 11%. In the United States, it's around 26%. It's higher in places like uh, Latvia, where traditionally jobs were assigned to people, or your education was assigned to you. You didn't have much of a choice. So there's much more of a, of a different kind of balance. So when you look at it that way, that's where you get into this yeah, really sticky conversation about it's not just about a lack of female presence in these different fields, but we're in the process of creating something like a gender, gender data gap that Carolyn Corrado Perez is talking about. 
And the kinds of examples that she talks about in her book are how this lack of paying attention to the female experience or to the female sort of in general has had a weird kind of rollout effect. And she gives the example of seatbelts and how when you look at car accidents, it looks like women are worse drivers than men because in the accidents they suffer you know, much more traumatic harms to the body. But when you look at it in a different way, it has to do with the way that seatbelts were made, that they were made for the male body and not for the female body. Or when you look at the pharmaceutical industry, that the majority of clinical trials happen on the male body and not the female body. And so you have some terrible side effects and consequences that females have had to, to go through just because drugs weren't tested on them. They weren't considered you know, an adequate and an appropriate uh, sampling for, the, for drug testing. So it's, it's about much more than just, you know, we have a lack of women in this space, but this lack of, of listening to the female voice or that perspective is actually resulted in bad products, right? Drugs that don't target what's actually going on or seatbelts that aren't, you know, conforming to the physiology of the individual. So it's much more than just numbers. It's the creation of bad products. So if we take this way of thinking and look at it in the robotic space, and we say, OK, let's, let's suggest that we have something like a gender data gap. If there's so few women, let's, let's you know, use our imaginations and explore this. And could this result in gendered robotics in AI, you know, robot products that exacerbate certain stereotypes about one gender over another? And could this then lead to some sort of disproportionate impact on women, you know, that, that maybe maybe women feel the benefits or the risks differently than men do. And this is all a hypothesis right now, right? So I'm, I'm saying this as putting the question on the table. This, this is a possibility based on the work that's already been done in a different space. And so to give a, a few examples of how we might look at studying this or uncovering this, I go back to the surgical robots example, uh, back to where I started. And I spent a lot of time talking with the nurses about you know, what what this meant for them, having the robot in, in their space now. And they used to tell me that you know, nobody was paying attention to the fact that now their jobs have completely changed. So robotic surgery is a part of minimally invasive surgery. The idea that if you're doing something like a heart surgery, normally you would have to crack open the sternum, and that's how you could get at the heart. But now with the robot, you can do these incisions. Yeah, You put the robotic arms into the patient, so you completely decrease the recovery time. Right? You're not waiting for the, for the patient's sternum to heal before you send them home. That means they're going home a lot faster. But that means someone has to take care of them at home. You don't have a nurse there to take care of you. So now the nurses are in a position where they have to train the people who are going to be at home how to take care of the patient who's going home earlier. And nobody was talking about that. And the nurses had no idea you know, that A, they should be doing this, and B, what is a good way or a right way of doing this? And should there be different kinds of follow-up? So the way that the robot was being evaluated was just in terms of how efficiently could it be done. And while I'm certainly not here to say we don't need to pay attention to efficiency, I'm just here to say that the way we evaluate technologies should be much broader than just the efficiency of the technology. We should look at the whole practice, because surgery is much bigger than just that moment, right? You have pre-op, post-op. There's a whole team of people who are involved. And so we should be paying attention to the team. So perhaps, perhaps, this idea of a lack of paying attention to the female voice puts us in a situation where we're evaluating the technology in a gendered way. And I say this knowing full well that this is making an assumption that one gender is the curer, the, the surgeon, and another gender is the care. So I, I, I say that I acknowledge that and I, I bracket that. Not only is it not about paying attention to the experiences of women, but what about the gendering of the technology? Right? And so when you look at a lot of the home assistants that are available today, so Siri, Google Home, Amazon Alexa, the majority of these have a female voice. And there's studies that are being done right now that are showing that the way this technology is meant to interact with you is in a very submissive, passive way. And now people are starting to question this and put this on the table and say, is there some sort of a statement about how a gender should perform in these situations? But if you're asked a question, you should answer it in a certain way. You should be very deferential to the person who answered it. Right? So people are just starting to pick at that. But are we reinforcing gender stereotypes in the way that we create robotics products? 
a question that's open. Another thing has to do with how people will perceive or be impacted by the robots. And so a big topic of consideration today are sex robots. In the top left-hand corner, this is Harmony. Am I allowed to say sex? Yeah, yeah you're in university. You know what's going on. Um, anyway, so sex robots are a thing. I don't know if anyone knew that, but robots that you can actually be... <laughs> Uh. <laughs> robots that you can actually be intimate with and physical with. Some of them are meant to be just sort of a one-off, that kind of thing. Others are meant to actually be more companionship-like. Can we and should we be engaging in relationships with robots? And then there's a fascinating line of work that talks about love with robots, right? If you're having sex with the robot on a regular basis, is it possible that you fall in love with this robot? If you fall in love with the robot, should you be allowed to marry the robot? Do robots have to be required to give consent? If you're gonna have sex with the robot, what does consent from a robot look like? What does it mean? Do we emulate it on how human-human interactions go? So there's a whole range of interesting questions that we can ask when we're talking about just sex robots in general. But some of the common issues or some of the common themes that come up today are the way that the, these sex robots look. That they're, you know, especially the feminine ones. The way that the, the female sex robots looks is a very kind of pornographic image of the female body. And so, if we look at the long-term impacts of this, could this have a negative impact on the way that females believe they're supposed to look or the way that they believe they're supposed to act? Or this question of consent, right? If, if people, you know, if we're talking about younger generations who have their first sexual experience with a robot, and that could train them or teach them into what it's like to have sex with other humans, right, they use that experience to learn from, and we haven't even thought about what consent looks like, could we be in a situation where we're retraining people, right, where, where consent is something that's kind of non-existent? And these are just questions, right? We're asking these questions right now, because there's still, it's still sort of a fetish or a niche space, but the idea is that there could be a differential impact, that women could experience this technology very differently from men. And sex robots is one example, but Robots in the classroom, robots that are personal assistants uh, in the home or, or whether or not they're chatbots. So it's looking at not just how the robot is portrayed, right, in, in the female form, but there's no studies on whether or not women interact differently with these robots than men and, and what this different interaction is like. Is it positive or is it negative? And that's something that we need to look at. So those were examples that showed the, the different nodes on this cycle that when we start with something like a lack of women in STEM, where could that take us? It could take us to a situation, most likely, where we have this thing called the gender data gap. And what that means is a lack of you know, paying attention or understanding of what the female experience is. And this can lead us into a situation where we are exacerbating cultural stereotypes of what women should be or shouldn't be. And this could ultimately lead to a disproportionate impact on how women experience their interactions with the technology. And so what I wanted to, you know, I keep coming back to this idea that ethics is about uncovering and, and putting these questions on the table. Could this be? Is this a situation where, where we could see ourselves in? But it doesn't end there, right? And so for the optimistic ethicist, it doesn't have to end there. Why, why not think about how we can change that? And this also goes back to using ethics something um, earlier on, as a resource earlier on to help us think about things in a different way. So instead of that vicious cycle, what if we were to imagine what a virtuous cycle could look like? You know, we, we took the, the worst possible situation you could have, what if we could imagine the best possible situation and then reverse engineer, how do we get there? So a good situation is, yeah, more women in STEM, which could lead to a closing of the gender gap where you have equal representation of voices, and this could, the, the ultimate you know, outcome of this could be inclusive robotics and artificial intelligence, where you, you have equal representation of voices. And I should also say too that I, I'm using the female male distinction, the binary distinction. I understand that this is much bigger than that, right? If we wanna talk about gender, then we need to acknowledge the fluidity 
as well, and that there are other uh, repressed or minority groups that should also be, we should also consider them as part of this cycle as well. I use this just for simplicity's sake. But the idea is with inclusive robotics and artificial intelligence, we can get ourselves closer to products that have equal risks and benefits between all stakeholders or all people in society. And so, you know, it's, it's one thing for us to say, oh, this is great, let's just do this virtuous cycle, la la la, and then we're done. But we have to go further than that, and we have to make sure, you know, this is what responsible robotics is about, identifying, okay, nice story, but now who is responsible, and what is it exactly that they're responsible for? And if we go back to this diagram, we can see, so for more women in STEM, there's a call to policymakers and to, and to educators to, to realize this, to create policy that actually enforces this, makes this a reality. They've shown, there's a lot of research out there that shows that if women have female role models, this is a huge bonus. This, is, this helps get younger girls encouraged in the topic and wanting to be there, seeing that that's something that they can do and, and facilitating it. So there's a call for policymakers and for educators if we're talking about just getting women in STEM, if we're talking about closing the gender gap or understanding what does inclusive robotics and AI mean, what are equal benefits, we need new ways of testing this. We need new empirical methods, qualitative and quantitative. And this is for academics and for industry alike. Right? How do we come up with new ways of studying this, new ways of, of measuring this and evaluating this? So there are specific things that people can actually do. And it's not just about the ethicists. So this goes back to my thing where I'm, I'm not trying to say that ethics is going to solve all of the world's problems. Ethics is there to uncover, this is, this is where we could go. But th maybe this is another alternative. And in order to get there, you need the cooperation and the joined up thinking of the ethicists with the engineers and the policymakers to actually realize this. So my last slide. So finally, just as a recap, again, sorry, this is the, the teacher. Huh? But just to make sure that we're all on the same page, yeah? I want to make sure that there's a, a couple of takeaway messages for you. Where I started this talk was looking at different kinds of vicious cycles, right? So I was looking at this idea of irresponsible robotics and what that might look like, the lack of incentives for companies, the lack of you know, a need to do better, which puts consumers in this disempowered position. And I looked at one specific cycle within this cycle, and that was the lack of women in STEM, and how that, you know, there's this cycle that keeps on feeding itself. And that ethics can be used not only to point out the fact that we're in this cycle, but also to disrupt it, to create different kinds of incentives, to point out how we might actually be able to disrupt it. And that one of the important questions that ethics asks of us is to make a distinction between can versus should. Yes, we can do a lot of things, but that doesn't mean that we necessarily should do all of them or any of them. And that it's not just about ethics and that ethics is gonna solve all of the world's problems. It's about joined up thinking between ethicists, between legal scholars, but also policymakers, and between all of the engineering disciplines in academia and in industry. I'm certainly not saying that academics can, can do this on their own or should do this on their own. And the last thing is that ethics can be used as this resource to paint a picture of what a virtuous cycle might look like. And then it's up to us to reverse engineer this, to figure out, okay, if this is where we wanna go, what do we have to do to actually get there? So with that, thank you very much for being here and for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions. C'è qualche domanda? Ok. Hi, thank you very much. A very big <laughs> conference. Uh, my question is more like um, you are, um, I completely agree with all of what you said, but to bring awareness, because we are aware about this because we work, we study, or we do something related with technology, but to the rest of the world that maybe is scared, how is the awareness of uh, this? Uh, to break the cycles of irresponsible robotics is going forward in the future and right now what is doing and how is it what are you what are, i mean not you but in the people that are working in this kind of uh, topics are going forward to bring awareness about this 
Yep. So what can, you mean, what can you do? Is this getting back to you? Okay. Uh, that's a great point. Um, and I'm happy to hear that some of these things are familiar to you already, because I know that if I'm speaking about this topic in a variety of different places, a lot of people say like, whoa, I, I, didn't, I didn't really think about that. Or this idea of a gender data gap, like what is that? And what, why should we care? So it's about thinking about the, the whole picture. But um, as a, a woman in this space, and so I'm in the humanities now, but I come from science, I feel a certain responsibility uh, for myself to be on stage having this kind of conversation. And I think that there's a responsibility for, for other women to do that as well, because role models is such an important thing. So if somebody, some young female in the audience says, oh my God, I didn't realize that was a job. You can be a robot ethicist. I want to do that. Then I've done my job. Yeah, then, then I feel like that's, I just needed one person. So please, I hope there's one person that was like, that's cool, I'm going to do that too. Um, so I think there's a responsibility for women in this space. Be vocal, be, be out there and help support the younger generations coming up. I think there's a, a responsibility for academics, male and female, to uh, be able to speak to policymakers and say, this is a situation that we're in. How can we figure out what to do? And that's a very complicated thing, thing to do. So I'm, I'm part of, of a group at the European Commission, and I also speak to uh, members of parliament quite often. So if you're in that position, then I would say, yeah, be, be a part of those conversations. So it's being aware, it's trying, trying to get the message out there, and, and it's also how you get the message out there. That, and I, I hope I did that today. It's not about, oh, what the fuck is going on? It's about saying, you know, let's put this on the table. This is a situation that we are currently in. The statistics show that we're in this situation. Let's think about where this could lead us, and let's do this together, not just one way. So it's how you approach it. It's a responsibility to be up here talking about it, and it's a responsibility to make sure that you use the opportunities that you have to help problem solve, not just, oh, this sucks, where we are. Yeah, but get forward. Does that answer your question? You could follow me on Twitter, I don't know. <laughs> You can also, it, it, it can help too if you find individuals that you, you want to work with, reach out to them. All the people, you know, all the people who are doing these kinds of talks are humans and, and if you want to do what they're doing, contact them and say, how, how can I be a part of that? Okay, a question. There's another one there. Uh, hi, I'm Sarah. Uh, my question is when, uh, this is my first time hearing about the, uh, your job, and when you choose about, uh, going to do ethics about, for robotics, uh, did you just go study and then go looking for an association that uh, already were, uh, are working on this? And did you find people excited about doing this uh, with you? Or did you start, uh, start uh, alone in, in this field? Yeah, that's a... It's a great question, Sarah. So when I left CSTAR, when I left my, uh, the, the Surgical Robotics Institute, I decided I was in Canada and I thought I'm going to come to Europe and study for a bit. I was going to go backpacking and do that whole, I mean, North Americans, we have this thing where you graduate and then you have to go to Europe and backpack for a year or so. And I thought, well, why don't I study? Because I couldn't afford <laughs> to, to be without a job for a year. So why don't I study? And, and I also wanted to understand this thing called ethics. And so I did a, one master's in applied ethics, loved it. I did another master's. I was living in Padua. It was amazing. And, um, and that was part of my studies. And then I found a PhD. And this was in 2008. The, the phrase robot ethics first came out in 2005. So I was part of a really small group of people that were interested in this topic. And I must say, at the beginning, it was really a struggle because people thought like, what are you talking about, robot ethics? That's crazy. Nobody was talking about it back then. But yeah, I, I mean, I, I believed that it was really important and I was passionate about it and I was trying to, to get the message out there. And now, right, 10, 11 years later, now we're in a situation where the world is starting to pay attention. So I think there was a bit of luck there that I had, but also perseverance that, yeah, you, you, if you're passionate about it, you, you, you keep doing it. So I went from studies and then I created the Foundation for Responsible Robotics. So that, that was another situation where I was really passionate about it. I saw, I saw a gap and I thought, uh, I, guess, I guess I can fill this, I don't know. So maybe that's crazy. 
or passionate. I don't know. There's, it's a balance between the two, right? Well, I have my staff bring my microphone for me, so that's, that's, that's cool. Uh, you, you talked about the um, overtrust of uh, robots and on um, technology. And so why, why do you think that this happens? Uh, why do you think uh, people overtrust robots over, over common sense and, and their own judgment? Do you think maybe it's because of uh, how the popul popular culture portrays robots and technology or something else. Yeah, yeah, I think, so this is also to where it would be naive of me to suggest that ethics can, you know, has the answers to these questions. This is getting into psychology, sociology, anthropology. So this is a, you know, it's a huge question. But I do think that a lot of this has to do with what we see in movies and that we believe that perhaps robots could be sentient, right? They could have some sort of understanding of pleasure and pain. Perhaps they have consciousness, you know? They can make certain, certain decisions. But we've had this, you know, the, it's been a theme and a trend that um, there is this deterministic view that technology is gonna, it's just gonna happen, we can't stop it. And that also there is this, yeah, recognition. We put technology on a pedestal and we want, we want it to be successful. So it's also an interesting balance, right? We, we want it to be successful and you have to trust at a certain moment it's gonna be reliable and you have to go along with it. But then there's this weird line between, you know, we trust that our alarm clock is going to wake us up in the morning versus we believe that we should drive into a, a river or a lake because the technology, technology was right. So where that line happens, we're, we're still figuring that out with, with robots. Don't know if that was quite the answer to your question, but it's huge. Psychology is also good. Uh, where I can start uh, uh, to be... Uh, in uh, this uh, uh, field of uh, ethics uh, for robotics. Sorry, uh, when did I where, start? Where I can... Where you start. can do it. Yes. Yeah. So there is no, like, master's program in robot ethics. We're, we're still at... We're still at the early stages, right? So I talk about it as if it's been around for ages and we've got all of these questions. It's, it's very much a, a dispersed group, a dispersed community. And it's very difficult to be able to do a PhD in robot ethics. Those are, you know, they're few and far between. But it's the kind of thing that now in academia we're pushing to have. So I've been pushing my university for the last couple of years, let me do a course on robot ethics. Let me just do that. So I'm starting to get at least my university around to the idea of let's have a course just within a computer science department or within a healthcare uh, biotechnology department or something like that. So we're still starting small. It'll be how can you find a course to do? And then hopefully in the next five years or so, you get a kind of master's program that is dedicated to this. And then who knows where, where the future would be. Sorry, I wish I had more. That's a great question, though. We should have a master's program in robot ethics. All right, I'll see you guys in like five years, and I'll be like, oh, we did it. Uh, hi, I have a question. Uh, what is your advice to all minorities in STEM? Because as you said, there are n not just women, but also immigrants and yeah. LGBTQ people and yeah. disabled people. And innovation is going towards the male man. I'm sorry. Yeah. But it's no, true. don't be sorry. And actually, like, what can each person do to feel like a part of the conversation and how can we create a community that can put pressure to the institutions? Because all of these changes need to be systemic, yeah. but it takes a long time. Yeah. What can we do in the meantime to yeah. not lose hope? Yeah, I think that's a fantastic question. And I'm glad you brought up the fact that this is much bigger than just the men versus women sort of gendering of technology. I would suggest finding other groups that already exist out there. So there's this whole movement about inclusive technology design, user-centered design, use-centered design, that kind of thing. Find the groups that are already out there. There's, there's, there are multiple groups and see how you can be a part of that and contribute to that. If you're a part of a design team, I don't know if you're in computer sciences or engineering or... Biomedical engineering. Okay, so what's also good too is to be able, if, if you're working in a team, to be able to say, you know, if we want to make good products, so it's not just, uh, it is about 
about getting your voice heard and getting that on the table, but say, look, if we want a lot of people to accept this and for this to be acceptable and we want it to be usable and user-friendly, we have to think about all the different people who might be using this, who might be confronted with it. And also institutions, they don't give equal chances to everyone. For example, I have a friend, he's becoming blind and he's becoming an engineer, but he cannot have the same textbooks that we have right. because there is no resource. Yeah, yeah. And so in the very particular cases, that's usually about going to professors, going to maybe even the dean and saying, this is my situation, this is what I need, or I don't know what I need, but who here can, can help me figure that out? And I, yeah, so maybe it's not fair to say that academics are open to this, but... They're not. Yeah, so, so then find people outside of the academic community that can help build support or, or find solutions to it saying, there is this textbook that might be an option. Can you fund it for me? Can you help me actually realize this and, and bring it there? So I think also there's, there's something to be said for how the problem is put forward in, instead of you know accusatory or this, this, this sucks, this is where I'm at, but just say like, I really want to study this. This is what I want to do. Can you help me realize this? Can, can we do this? together and that is a powerful story one that no very few people can say no to to that some people will but but that's a difficult thing to turn down to look at a student who's like I want to be a student and to study engineering and you say like nah I don't have the time uh, you know and then go to the press with that but many people don't believe it's an option when you're sick or disabled to become yeah. the person who fixes your problem yeah no, I agree. And that's where it, it's true that society needs to, there's a lot that society has to do to, to change that way of thinking. Sorry, I don't have the answer to that. Okay, guys. So last question. Do you have a last one? Thank you. Hello, hi. I was wondering, um, uh, what's your opinion about what politics and government should do Oof. to really make an impact uh, on uh, responsible robotics? Yes. And if you think this should be like a, a big organization uh, worldwide uh, or uh, if uh, any nation should act uh, by itself, uh, what's your opinion about yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. So thank you. That's a great question. Um, right now, I run the Foundation for Responsible Robotics in the not-for-profit space, which is great because it means when people look at the foundation, they understand that we're not out there trying to make a profit. So we have different incentives. It means we're creating something for a different reason. It also means that we have no funding because we won't take money from companies because we want to maintain our neutral stance, right? So it's all volunteers doing it. I would say at that moment, that's when we need governments to step in and say, let us, let us finance some of this. Let us hire people to help you. Um, but I also, I don't want to say government, right? Because as we all hopefully know, every country has a different government and they function very differently. Right? And so without getting too political about it, in some places in the world, I'm not sure if I would want that government you know, in charge of what I do. So it's, it's difficult to be able to say, yeah, the government should be helping this, this kind of situation. Um, I do think the government has a role, though, also in paying attention to these small grassroots organizations, to the not-for-profits who are trying to do something and to come up, because they have to create policy. So they should be paying attention. What are the things that these... Um, not activists, but these, uh, you know, people who are inspired and want to want to make a difference. What are they paying attention to? And perhaps we should also be paying attention to that. So we are trying to help governments put certain things on the agenda. I think it's important for governments to fund certain not-for-profit organizations. But I don't think that the regulation of technology, full stop, should always be up to the government. So I, I, I full heartedly believe in the GDPR and I think that's great, but there's also this weird race that's happening between uh, Europe as a whole and China and the United States in terms of artificial intelligence. And there are three different ways of thinking about society and therefore ways of thinking about how technology should function in society. So it's a really tender you know, dance that, that you have to play. There is a relationship, but there should never be a dependence, a codependence between the two. So make a big applause to Emmy Van Weisberg. Thank you so much. Thank you.
È il momento ragazzi quindi di un altro straordinario momento, allora chiamo i tecnici per fare gli ultimi setup e poi possiamo partire con la finale del Gillette Trophy di Fortnite organizzata dai Campus Party Sparks, avremo un momento dove premieremo un, uh, il vincitore di un torneo online, adesso fra qualche istante vi diremo